Hello and welcome to The Press Room with WCN-TV, where we dive deeper into topics from recent editions of the Wilson County News. The Press Room is brought to you by the Wilson County News, your source for community and communication. I'm your host, Julia, the Marketing and Social Media Specialist. Today's episode is sponsored by the Go Wilson free community app. Go Wilson is a product of the Wilson County News, a free app where you can access the Wilson County News and all of its digital content, the Lavernia News and all of its digital content, the Go Wilson 360 free community calendar, and City of Floresville resources, all in one. Digital content for each accessible newspaper includes all the articles with the ability to listen to the audio versions in the article or in the audio article player, plus the e-edition, burn ban updates, breaking news, all our video content, and more. With the connection to the City of Floresville, you can even pay your water bill through the app. To download the app today, visit GoWilsonApp.com or look up Go Wilson in your app store. Everything we're talking today has appeared in recent editions of the weekly Wilson County News. We're covering the following topics. Wilson County District 2 Emergency Services is getting help from above in the form of small unmanned aerial systems. Commonly known as drones, the new technology has assisted the Emergency Services District on 10 calls since March. America Reads is a volunteer-run program led by RSVP, which aims to improve literacy rates among American children. However, the program is unique in that it simultaneously helps senior citizens. Learn how RSVP and America Reads is able to accomplish both. You can subscribe to print, digital, or both editions of the Wilson County News at wilsoncountynews.com slash subscribe, so you never miss an edition of your local newspaper. Feel free to follow us where you're watching today so you're always up to date on the press room and our other WCN TV news. Now's a good time to update your subscription or subscribe if you don't already and save on the newsstand cost of getting your local news. While presidents in Washington DC and governors in Austin have changed through the last dozen or so years and the price of postage stamps has gone up every year, sometimes more than once, one thing hasn't changed and that's the cover price of your weekly Wilson County news. That's right. The Wilson County News has been 75 cents since before Governor Greg Agate was elected the first time and before Joe Biden ever served as vice president. But that will change in July. We've kept the price down as long as we could, but due to the increasing costs of paper, printing, and postage, the price at our newsstands will go up from 75 cents to $1.50 in mid-July, and subscription rates will also increase. See the subscription form on page 4B in your Wilson County News or visit wilsoncountynews.com slash subscribe to get your news at today's prices. First on today's show, you'll meet Alex Lopez, Assistant Fire Chief at Wilson County District 2 Emergency Services. He'll explain more about the help from above District 2 is now receiving thanks to new technology. Welcome to the press room. Thank you. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So who are you and where are you from and what do you do with Wilson County District 2 Emergency Services? Okay, uh, a little bit about me. My name is Alex Lopez. I'm currently the Assistant Chief with Wilson County District 2 Fire and EMS. Uh, I've been with the department for about seven years now. Uh, in total though, I've been a firefighter EMT going on 17 years. Wow. Yeah, most of my experience prior to coming out to Wilson County was in Bear County. Okay. Uh, where I was there for probably about 10, 10, 11 years before I came out here. Um, I'm also a paramedic as well. So depending, prior to my chief position, I would be either on the fire truck, ambulance, kind of rotated around in that yeah. sense. So Very cool, very cool. It seems like you have a really versatile background. I do, yes. Um, just fire and EMS in general, uh, with us being an all hazards type of response to yeah. multiple things we're going to have to be kind of well versed in a lot of stuff um, but it's, it's something I, I love I enjoy doing helping out the community uh, and things like that so I try to do my best in, in everything anything that I put my foot forward in so so what is Wilson County District 2 emergency services you know what areas do you protect and what services do you provide so we provide fire and EMS services okay. uh, to our coverage area. We're currently located in the northwestern part of Wilson County, sure. closer towards like 181 in a 1604 area. All right. Um, we have two stations. Uh, typically on shift, we have about six personnel and two admin on staff. It just varies on days and things like that. But uh, we cover a well-versed area. We do have a lot of... Um, subdivisions things like that and then also a lot of like land farmland properties okay. things like that so we're kind of uh, in an area where 
we see a lot of a little bit of everything in that yeah. sense, especially with the highway that we cover. Um, it's a pretty large strip that we cover, so unfortunately, we do get uh, wrecks and things like that, you know, in that area. And that falls into your jurisdiction of you Cor- can't help with correct. that. Correct, yeah. yeah, in that coverage area. So this may be a kind of a dumb question, but do both of your are both of your stations equipped with both fire and EMS, or do you send like fire from one and EMS from the other? No, uh, not a dumb question at all. Uh, we have both stations do have firefighting apparatuses, um, and we also have what we call them MICU uh, ambulance units. Okay. So basically, if that medic unit is staffed with a paramedic, uh, what they can do is a little bit more. Than, than like a EMT basic or a, yeah. an advanced EMT in that in that sense, but uh, both stations have primary fire trucks engines. Um, they both have brush trucks and they both have ambulances as well. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So when did Wilson County District Two Emergency Services start looking into unmanned aerial systems as an additional way to protect our citizens? A uh, good question. You know, I think it started. The idea started probably towards the end of last year. Uh, one of the guys was talking about getting a Christmas gift for a family member or something like that. And then I've heard of other departments having um, UAS right or a drone program for the fire department. And so I took it upon myself to kind of do a lot of research uh, into that. Uh, it started with uh, making sure that we're compliant with like states, or, I'm sorry, local, state, and federal regulations. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of extensive research that I did on my own to figure out what we need to do to be able to utilize a drone program um, for our department. But, you know, looking to the FAA and what was needed in their sense to be able to be compliant with them. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know, but you know, there's certain areas, especially with bases and airports, you cannot fly drones near them or around them yeah. and things like that. Um, I also looked into uh, the NFPA, uh, which is a, a National Fire Protection Agency, uh, on some training classes that they do have online for drone programs. And they get pretty in-depth uh, just from uh, studies and things that they've done to basically help kind of departments literature to help them develop a drone program that will be successful for them. Sure. Um, every department, every location, geographically, things like that is different. So it might vary uh, department to department. And then I also looked at state, you know, which usually the state will defer to the FAA. Uh, it's a higher, you know, federal level on what is needed in order to stay compliant. But there was some things that we have to definitely keep in mind uh, to make sure that we're staying in compliance at all levels. Right, that so. makes sense. So what are some of those guidelines then? Maybe a few off the top of your head that struck you as, wow, I didn't think about this before or... Yeah, you know, a lot of what we know about drones in general, um, especially for in the sense of just uh, leisure, right? To yeah. People that use them just to kind of, you know, I'll play around, take photos with families, things like that. Um, compared to using it in a fire department setting, which they would consider, FA considers us uh, in the sense of a business, yeah. um, there is uh, regulations that we have to follow. Um, there's two ways you can, can go about creating a drone program for your fire department. Um, one would be getting a certification of authorization through the FAA, which okay. is basically a, a pass to have the department create their own drone program, but also do internal training. There's not actually any licensure that you need to obtain through the FAA. Okay. Uh, that process is a little bit longer to get that application sent and for them to review it and things like that. Um, or option B would be um, the individual that's being utilized to operate the drones for the department, uh, them getting their Part 107 license. Huh. And um, the Part 107 license through the FAA, basically it's the best way to look at it is like getting your driver's license for a car for a okay. vehicle um, in the sense of, you know, the questions that they ask is obviously geared towards drone and flying, but being safe, following uh, state, local, you know, and federal regulations uh, and things like that, you know, with drones in general, there is a certain weight limit of about 249 grams that if your, your um, drone weighs less than that, you don't have to register it with the FAA. You can use it for leisure. There is still some rules that apply, and it's yeah. a, a list of them. Uh, but getting your Part 107 
or getting your uh, COA for the fire department, that kind of lets us allow allows us to fly drones at night, uh, lets us to utilize drones for emergency calls, um, things like that in that sense. Okay. So it gives us a lot of leeway on a, a lot of applications in the field. Yeah. I feel like a lot of these guidelines are probably geared toward protecting the privacy of individuals. Correct. Right? Yes. So. And, and that's a very big thing nowadays is the privacy of, of uh, the citizens and things yeah. like that. Um, you know, when people see drones in the, in the air, you hear stories of people shooting them down or things like that. Um, but I can definitely say you know, there is a right place and time to use these devices uh, that can definitely be beneficial for fire departments. Um, you know, the decision comes from one of the chief officers to even launch one of them, depending on the call or situation. Uh, but we take that all into consideration, you know, uh, doing some extensive research in that even with any of the data that we collect in the sense of pictures, videos, yeah. um, they are secured on, on files, secured files in that nature and it's only utilized for either training purposes or for um, case studies in a sense of sure. that call that we just had what can we do better what happened on that call you know it's very informational on wind direction travel of fire things like that uh, but it's something that we do definitely take seriously in, in that sense uh, in nature and when we're on you know when we're on calls and depending on the situation um, every opportunity that we do have to inform uh, maybe the homeowner or, you know, the property owner or things like that, we definitely take that step to let them know what's going on. That's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that said, what kind of drones did y'all end up purchasing and why did y'all choose those? So we have two different models. Um, the first one that we were able to obtain is the DJI Mini 3 Pro. Um, that model itself is more so in a sense utilized, I guess, by civilians for sure. um, picture taking, video yeah. taking. The quality is very high. Um, it's 4K uh, video with 2K picture capabilities. Wow. Um, it's a live feed, direct live feed that uh, the remote control that we got with that uh, UAS system, um, it's directly tied into the camera. So it's real time when we're flying it. You can um, like see what it's... Correct, yeah, the path, the travel of path, uh, elevation, you know, uh, it has zoom, zoom in capabilities as well, and things like that. So that model price range was probably about $1,000. Um, it does not have flare uh, infrared, right, forward looking infrared uh, capabilities. Yeah. Um, it does not have any kind of like spotlighting at night or, or speaker systems or anything like that. Uh, it's more so utilized in the setting of during the day right yeah. uh, and things like that the second model that we do have is the Altel uh, Evo 2 okay and uh, that one is one that's more geared towards search and rescue that one does have a flare uh, camera on it forward-looking infrared uh, this one is a little bit bigger a little bit quicker uh, in a lot of settings and that drone itself uh, has uh, the capabilities to put a spotlight on there to put a speaker in case we need to speak to somebody, you know, uh, from a distance through the drone and things like that. The, the Altel uh, Evo is the one that's more seen uh, with yeah. uh, fire departments and things like that. It's a little bit more pricier, though. Makes um, sense. It's got all these different kinds of capabilities, too. Correct, yeah. yeah. So that one, again, that can be used night or day in, in that setting. Yeah. yeah. And so I think you've kind of gone into what capabilities the drone has, but how are y'all applying that to your life-saving scenarios, you know? Uh, situational, you know, like I was saying uh, earlier, I can't stress enough that we don't use them, you know, on every call. Yeah. Um, there's a, definitely a time and place, and I'm very big on that, uh, when we do uh, utilize them in the field. But um, a couple of instances that we have used them before, you know, the DGI one we've used a few handful of times for grass fires, where, okay. you know, there might be a windy day. Um, and we need to see where the travel direction that fire might be going, the size of it. Yeah. You know, if uh, we always constantly are doing updates on our scenes just to see if we're making progress on extinguishment, um, yeah. if it's getting out of control, do we need more resources? So it, it definitely plays a big strategic, uh, you know, at a level in the sense we're planning as a chief officer. We definitely take that uh, real time information and have to analyze on a moment's notice. Uh, what our next steps or future steps might be to right. manage that incident. 
That makes a lot of sense. And I can see how an aerial view of especially a grass fire in our very grassy, yeah. dry, windy, often area mm -hmm. could be to like see it changing. Because otherwise you just have to kind of yeah. guess and feel from ground level. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and that That's can be scary. very difficult at times to cross terrain right yeah. uh, in that setting just because of the heat right um limited areas of uh being able to you know get into where the fire's at uh, on foot and things like that this provides a quicker safer uh method in the sense of uh, getting updates on on our fire scenes and things like that it's amazing yeah it's it's helped out a, a ton uh, when we do utilize it and there was one instance where we had a gentleman that, that got lost in an, an unknown area, kind of just like a, a farmland. Wow. And we had utilized uh, the uh, one of the drones to be able to just kind of, you know, see where he's at. He was able to contact dispatch and they stayed on the phone with him. And basically he was just giving us his uh, surroundings, right, uh, where he might be at. And use, utilizing the drone, we were able to find him. You That's know, so and, and bring him out to wherever he got lost in, you know. Wow. So yeah. multiple, multiple applications for sure, you know. Uh, in the seven years that I've been here, we've had multiple scenarios uh, at the San Antonio River Authority, where the San Antonio River kind of runs through our area, right. where we have kayakers or people on canoes that get lost. And this yeah. might be a, you know, it hasn't happened to where we've had the drones right to utilize, but in the past, uh, it was hours of us having to cross so much terrain and area to kind of locate these people, right, citizens. Um, in that area that they might get lost or sometimes I've heard that they've gotten stuck on the river and things like that Yeah, I can see how that would be really helpful and yes. mm -hmm. again potentially life-saving. So wow With the drones, what other developments are y'all working on and outside of the drones? So um, with the drone program again, uh, like I said, there's a very extensive training that has to come with that Yeah. Um, you know, it's something that we want to make sure that we're staying compliant at all levels with so uh, for example myself I have my part 107 license you know I, I took a online NFPA drone program um, I also created uh, with assistance of the lieutenants in chief and uh, standard operating procedure uh, to follow when utilizing the drones uh, in the field and things like that and uh, to reiterate with the privacy because you know a lot of people do have concerns about where these videos going where the pictures yeah. are going and things like that um, when it comes to using them, you know, in the field, uh, depending on the incident, um, it's always going to be secured, you know, on file on any information that we do obtain. And it's purely and strictly only for use of the fire department only. You know, it's not something that we will hand out or publicize or, or anything, like, anything like that. Um, you know, we're very particular on making sure we respect the privacy of the citizens. And like I said, you know, if there's a, a you know, a, given the situation, if we're able to contact that person, homeowner, anything like that, we will definitely inform them that, hey, you know, we did utilize, utilize a drone uh, to assist on, you know, managing this incident. Um, understand that, you know, you do have privacies and uh, it's just utilized for, you know, managing the scene a little bit better, yeah. which has helped out, you know, uh, a lot in that sense. And a lot of people, probably don't know either uh, we are you know our drones are insured as well okay. so not only for when we use them but also if god forbid something were to happen to them or they cause some kind of damage to the property or something like that we yeah. are insured as well so okay. we're, we're making sure that we're doing everything right uh, in that sense covering all your bases correct that's yes. awesome very good uh some things that our department has been you know um tackling and working on is we do have a therapy dog program sure. um, the Malinois uh, dog that we have chief our chief actually owns the dog uh, his name is Ace um, we have gone a couple times to Conley Memorial Medical Center uh, to help with just kind of you know in the moment patients might be not feeling too well their yeah. spirits aren't high and things like that and uh, Ace is able to he's been trained he's certified uh, he's able to pick up on that and kind of like you know nudge his head against them so they can kind of pet him yeah. um, feel loved from from him and things like that and, th and that's helped out a lot uh, I've gone a couple times with our chief to the hospital and to be able to interact with patients right uh, to them that might be their 
worst time ever, you know, suffering a medical condition or something right. like that. And just being able to take time and uh, take ace for the day over there uh, kind of uh, you know, uplifts our spirits and, uh, and things like that. So uh, we try to be very involved with, you know, any type of um, public relations and things yeah. like that. Uh, often you hear people hear that, you know, a lot of family members or friends or citizens come to the stations and get tours and things like that. Uh, but we're always open to that. You know, if anybody needs a visit with Ace, uh, that's definitely out there uh, to ask for, and we'll definitely show up and do our best. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, very heartwarming. Um, another thing, too, that we're, we've are we been doing at Wilson County District, too, is uh, we've been doing a lot of training with our IQ Butterfly device. Okay. And uh, what that is, basically, is an in-field ultrasound device. Yeah. Um, that's definitely you know, useful in the field for certain applications and things like that. And uh, currently we're in the process of just onboarding our EMTs to be able to utilize the device sure. uh, in different uh, types of settings. Um, our medical director, Dr. Ogden, actually purchased that device for our department. And he's been helpful with the onboarding of that device as well. But uh, it could just be anywhere and everywhere from making sure that um, during CPR, we're getting good chest compressions and we're moving blood through the heart uh, all the way to being able to utilize to maybe start an IV that we can't physically see the vein yeah. on the skin and things like that. So many different applications just dependent on uh, the route that the medical director wants it to be used for. Um, but um, he's very involved with our department in training and making sure that we have the most up-to-date equipment for our department as well. Awesome. That all being said, it seems like there's a lot to keep up with. Um, where can folks go to do that or to learn more about Wilson County District 2 Emergency Services? Yes, yeah, so uh, we actually have a Facebook page, the Wilson County SD2. Uh, you can search us on there. Uh, we're pretty up to date on there with just updates, pictures, things like that. And then we also have a, a webpage, WCESD2TX.US, okay. that people can kind of uh, you know look, look on to for different updates and things like that. Awesome. And if folks are interested in trying to join your emergency response team, where can they go for more information about that? Uh, definitely the website, the WCESD2TX.US, or they're always welcome to come in person, 9 to 5, to either our Cimarron station, uh, 191 Cimarron Drive, Floresville, Texas, or the uh, Central Station, which is 11382 FM775. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for your time today for telling us more about these really cool devices that you're able to use to really help not just keep our community safe, but it also seems like helping keep your department safe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next, you'll meet RSVP, an organization dedicated to improving the lives of vulnerable populations through education and wellness, and by supporting nonprofits through skill-based programs. Let's learn how their program, America Reads, is making differences in the lives of both students and retired seniors. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, it's great to have you all. So who are you, where are you from, and what do you do with RSVP? Well, I'm Barbara Weiland, the director of RSVP, and before moving to Seguin five years ago, I lived in Houston for 30 years. And I worked mostly in nonprofits, either in research or social services. Very cool. And how about yourself? I'm Patricia Buckley. I am the area coordinator for Guadalupe and Wilson Counties. I'm a retired teacher, reading specialist, and elementary principal. Awesome. So when I heard that they needed someone to train teach train tutors, help put them in the schools, coordinate with the schools, I thought that it would be a good job for me. So. Absolutely. <laughs> so it seems I enjoy like Barbara it. agrees. Yeah. 
So let's talk, what is RSVP and when and why was it founded? Okay, well, RSVP stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program. Okay. And it's under the umbrella of AmeriCorps. Now, um, oh. AmeriCorps was originally called Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTA. Huh. And that was established in 1965. Um, so that went on where people would go into urban areas and they were paid to help support um, basically community development, educational resources, social resources. And then in 90, 96 is when it kind of morphed into AmeriCorps. One of the organizations under AmeriCorps is AmeriCorps Seniors and AmeriCorps Seniors is involved in foster grandparents, oh. senior companions, okay. and RSVP. So RSVP cool. helps communities recruit seniors to put in other nonprofits and provide volunteer services to the community in general. All right. And also in 96, we in our service area started the tutoring program okay. and it's called childhood literacy program All right. so that's kind of how it progressed right. um, and the RSVP in this service area which includes Comal County, Guadalupe County, Hayes County and Wilson County um, actually was established in 1974 cool. so we've been around quite a while yeah, it seems like it. And so the America Reads program, I understand that is the childhood literacy program that you mm -hmm. mentioned. So this seems like it has a fairly obvious answer, but what is the issue that America Reads aims to solve? Okay, it's sponsored, we're sponsored by Texas Lutheran University. Okay. And we focus on helping kids from kindergarten through third grade uh, who are reading below grade level to improve their reading skills sure. um, and and in general just learn to like learning better right. you know be more involved what we have found is since the pandemic that first year back to school in person they had some really significant reading deficits now that's improved yeah. but the latest statistics from the texas education association showed that 50% of the students leaving third grade were not reading at grade level. Wow. That's half our kids. Um, and lot. it can have a huge impact on later education. Right. Um, and I just wanted to mention this particular program and how it's implemented in the schools is based on a research model that has shown this method to be very effective. And it's basically one-on-one -on -one tutoring for 30 minutes at a time, once a week. Wow. And we've had volunteers say, how can that help anybody in such a short little amount of time? But when we collect the information at the end of the year, it is very effective. So even though volunteers may think that they're not accomplishing much they really do yeah. they really do um, and the teachers are delighted with it that's awesome yeah. Okay. yeah we're really proud of that if a child doesn't read well by the time they're out of third grade and teachers say from kindergarten through third grade students learn to read from third grade on they read to learn yes because the schools stop teaching reading after third grade so that's why that third grade is so important. And some statistics that I've found say that children who cannot read at grade level by the end of third grade are four times more likely to drop out of school before high school graduation. Less than 20% of students who read below grade level in third grade attend college. 88% of students who don't graduate high school were struggling readers in the third grade. And the scariest one is that approximately 80% of prison inmates in Texas are functionally illiterate. And that is a frightening statistic. That is, oh my gosh. That so, we are really hoping to help change yeah. that. So you can see that this program not only helps individual students, 
it helps taxpayers. Yeah. Because that's just that's fewer inmates that that we're, that, that we're funding in the long run, right? Exactly. I'll tell you one of the things that we really do, and she's going to hit on this later, is we really give the kids self confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. They we provide the person to read with them because a lot of times at home the parents are working they're over they're way too busy they have other kids they have to deal with they, yeah. by the time they get home they're exhausted I know as a parent that happens to me mm -hmm. and so we provide that older grandparent figure mm -hmm. to just sit and read with them and when they read with that person they're like great job you know I like this book too it just makes the kids light up yeah. So they get a lot of positive reinforcement. Yeah. Um, and so many kids, like Patty said, just there isn't time in their own household. So many parents now have multiple jobs. Yes. Yeah. So um, finding the time to really pay attention to and work on that with their kids exactly. can and, be challenging. And we've heard back from teachers that the kids are so excited to meet with their their tutors and even years later if they see their their tutors out someplace they'll you know call their name and run up to them yeah. remember me so and i've heard stories about that from our volunteers all of the schools have built in an intervention time they all do all okay. of the school all of the public schools in texas build in an intervention time which is time that we use to catch up for missing education right but they only have so many people to work with kids yeah and the kids we work with are the ones who are kind of the middle of the pack they're not getting a lot of extra attention so we're providing that that said do you have any signs that parents can look for in their children to determine whether they may need to play some catch up with their reading skills yeah absolutely um if your child is showing some anxiety about reading if they try to avoid reading altogether, if they have difficulty sounding out words or recognizing words, um, if they have problems understanding what they just read, yeah. they may not be putting those concepts together, which is a, a, um, a comprehension issue. Uh, if they have difficulty with spelling and writing, that's also related to reading. Okay. If tasks involving reading and writing take an unusually long time to complete or if they're easily distracted while reading. Those are all signs. All right. Well, good things to look out for. So that said, how can parents or school districts make the America Reads program available to their children? <laughs> Patty can tell you that because that's what she does. Yeah. Well, the schools actually choose the kids who are involved and they choose them based on what I mentioned earlier. They're the students who don't have other programs working for them. Okay. They're those middle of the road kids. Um, that being said, parents can always talk to the teachers and say, is there anything you guys can do for my child? I heard there's this program, maybe we can get them involved. Yeah. Um, Parents can help us by helping us to recruit volunteers. Mm -hmm. okay. If they know older people in the community, grandparents, anybody like that, they can suggest to them that they do this. And and I will tell you, for what she's saying, the anxiety, the not understanding what they read, not remembering what they read, this is absolutely the best thing to do. Just mm -hmm. let them practice. And the way we do it is, the adult and the child sit one-on-one, -on -one, they pick a book, they kind of take turns reading. It depends upon the age of the child. Some children, you know, if they're kindergarten, yeah. then we're working on sounds and putting those sounds together. But if they're older kids, we're working on reading. If they're really struggling readers, then what we do is repeated reading. And the adult will read and then the child will read after them. And we okay. keep doing that until they get the fluency and they have enough practice that they can read smoothly and remember it. But it's all about practice. And so that's really what we provide them. Um, again, if a parent wants their child to be part of the program, they can talk to the schools. We are trying really hard to get as many volunteers as we can in the schools so that we have more people yeah. to work with kids. Because especially those parents who are working, we understand that. Schools don't look at parents and go, it's your fault. They don't do that. They, they know that parents need help. Yeah. And so we will do all we can to try and place 
children with an adult so that they can get that need taken care of. Sweet. Okay. And so let's talk more about the volunteering aspect of America Reads. So why does this program invite individuals 55 and older to volunteer? I know it makes sense being under the tier of RSVP programs, but you know, why is it encouraged for seniors to do this? Well, there are a number of positive effects for seniors who volunteer. Um, okay. And this is also based on, on research by AARP and the National Institute on Aging. Um, it's been shown that volunteering is good for their mental and physical health. There are less cases of depression um, that have been reported in volunteers over 55. And there are there's also some research that suggests that there is um, less heart disease wow. in people yeah. who volunteer. It also prevents loneliness and isolation, which is something that can happen when you retire. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're not going to the office. You're not seeing those people. Right. Um, and people can really start to feel useless and depressed. Um, and going on that same subject, it gives people a sense of purpose, particularly a program like this, yeah. where they're actually seeing a child improve in their reading so they can improve in, in their classwork, in the school, they can graduate. It really makes them feel good about what they're doing. Right, they get to witness the effect. Right. Yes, definitely. It helps them make new friends, which we've seen a lot in Wilson County, that people yes. have yeah. bonded around their their tutoring mm -hmm. experiences. They go out, they have networking. coffee. They, uh, it, it's really nice. It's great. Um, they found that volunteering increases physical activity, which is really important to physical Absolutely, health. Yes. And it bridges the generation gap. You know, so many times children are separated from older adults. Um, in our current society, so many times... Families are very mobile, so it's not like 50 years ago where you have the grandparents right there right. available and they see the kids. Um, but even if they do, just being exposed to other people who are older creates an understanding between them that benefits not only the child, but it also benefits the volunteer, the senior volunteer. Right, understanding this new generation of leaders and, mm -hmm. and the exactly. people who are going to make things happen. And let me just say technology, okay? <laughs> there, are, there are way too many six and seven year olds who can run circles around adult volunteers with our program as far as technology goes. Yes. And the kids do show them how to do certain things. <laughs> um, very cool. Mutual benefits there. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> So it also helps people engage with old interests, you know, things that they didn't have time for before they retired. Yeah. Um, so that's really helpful. A way to get your foot back in the door. And it helps seniors learn new skills. And I know that's true because almost all of our seniors report how many hours they've spent and different things like that through email. They learn how to manipulate email to send information back and forth. And for some people, it's a brand new experience. So they have at least those skills. But there are other skills, too, related to the volunteering, global scheduling, yeah. um, interacting with other volunteers, interacting with Patty. Um, Learning how to interact with kids, too. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I do spend a lot of time training my volunteers to make sure that they have ideas of what to do and they'll call me and they'll say this child is having this problem and I'll say why don't you try this this and this yeah. and they'll try that it just it helps the kids so much but the volunteers feel great and they call me and they say hey I was doing such and such with the kid and it worked great is that a good idea oh that's great <laughs> basically go with your gut yeah. <laughs> but we also have a list of things they can and can't do because well, we follow like all school policy, <laughs> you know, that it's like, right. and our volunteers have to meet the same qualifications as any other volunteer in the school. Right. So that may change district to district. So basically whatever is allowed in your school district. Right. That's what we follow the school district yeah. guidelines. The school districts do the background checks for us to make sure that they are completely vetted. Awesome. Um, and we do all of that before we ever go into school. So. Wow, yeah, so you get like double background check. <laughs> yes. Well, and we always coordinate with the school, the administration at the school. We have to identify a person who works in the school 
that communicates with us so that we know how the program's going, if the school's going to be closed a particular day, right? Um, if the kids are having testing on a particular day. So there's a real close relationship between the school and our program. Well, that's awesome. So my next question, sticking on the topic of volunteering, what are a volunteer's typical responsibilities? You mentioned 30 minutes at a time, you know, do they get to choose the schools and students they work with? Well, first of all, I want to talk about how people enter the program, and that yeah. is they get in touch, well, usually Patty will get in touch with them, but if they haven't seen Patty yet, they can call our office, and I'll give you that information in a second. Absolutely. But they go through the background check with the school, and then we have a training. It's a four-hour training, and each okay. volunteer tutor goes through that training where we have, we have a handbook that talks about school policy, state laws, anything that has to do with working with children, yeah. that's a regulation. And then we have um, different like handouts within that, that manual, like ABCs and the oh, numbers, sure, yeah. and then typical sight words that the different grade levels mm -hmm. need to learn. Yeah. Um, so we use that a lot, um, but Patty can go ahead and talk about the specific day-to-day -day tutoring. Yeah, and day-to-day -day tutoring, normally we put each tutor with two children so that their time is valuable, well, their time's valuable anyway, but if they're going to go to a school, we want them to be there at least an hour because sure, yeah. 30 minutes is not much. And so they, they arrive at the school and they meet with their, their coordinator and they pick up the child and they go to the designated area, usually the library. They sit yeah. down, they read with the child for 30 minutes and then they return the child to class. Um, they, they do that 30 minute session once a week with two different students. Um, we normally have some backup students in case those students are absent. Sure. So that they don't drive to the school and there's nobody yeah. to tutor. So if they get there and, and their student is absent, then they can work with one of the backup students, another student. So that student won't get the full amount that the other students get, but they get a little bit and every yeah. little bit helps. Like I said, they can they do two students usually. They can do more if they want to do more. We have one tutor in one of my schools who works with I think six students. She comes in and wow. she works with six students because she drives all the way from Luling to work yeah. in one of our schools you in Sakeen. make that drive worth it. <laughs> so she stays all day and works with kids all day because yeah. it just makes it worth it. Um, so they do that. The only paperwork they do for us is they keep track of the hours that they spend with the students and they write in a notebook for each child positive feedback for the day. Right. And then at the end of the program, the child gets the notebook. Aww. So they get to That's review sweet. all the positive things that they accomplished over the school year, right. which is just another reinforcement for them to feel good about themselves, to gain confidence, yeah. to... And then to, that's immediately putting those reading skills to use, right. reading the notebook. Exactly. The notebook. Like, that's yes. so cool. And then okay. if the tutors are, again, we talked about that, if the tutors are uncomfortable with something, if they're having a problem, they just pick up the phone and call me. Yeah. And I can come in and sit side by side with them. I can tell them things to do over the phone. I can make them materials. Those sight words that we give them are generic sight words. Some school districts have their own. I make yeah. flashcards and things for those. We do a lot to support our tutors. And that's one of the things that I want to make sure people know. When they come in, we're not just saying, go read with this kid. Right. We're giving you training. We're giving you lots of support. But bottom line, you're just kind of being a grandma. Yeah, and you're definitely not on your own. Right. Yeah. Well, definitely. and then I forgot about the bins. We have Ooh. bins that we supply. Um, they're in each school, but they have materials that the tutors can use. Okay. Um, like marker boards, yeah. colored pens, colored pencils. Just anything you might need to help. Little books. Exactly. And little stickers. And yeah. we can, in their notebooks, we can, you know, the tutors can put stickers you know, for the day because they did... You know, such and such, great. Um, and the reason we do that is not only to support the volunteers, but to make sure that we're not using any of the resources from taking away from the school. Yeah. Because, you know, the schools are working on a tight budget. 
Exactly. So we don't want to be any sort of a burden on the school either. And so this way, all you're doing is helping. Exactly. That's awesome. Great. Absolutely. And so if someone were to want to learn more about RSVP or the America Reads program or even get involved as a volunteer or as a school district, right. get their school district involved with RSVPs, America Reads, where should they go? Well, <laughs> there are a couple of ways you can contact us. One is to call the office and that number is 830-379-379. 0300. Yeah. They can email us at rsvp at tlu.edu. Right, because Texas Lutheran University is our sponsor. It. Okay. Um, or they can contact Patty, whose information is generally all over town. <laughs> <laughs> the library, the school, sometimes in the restaurants in town have boards. Sure. Um, I try to put things up pretty much all over the place. Um, so just look around in your town and you'll you'll find flyers. Awesome. Um, but if you don't call me, right. Yes. You can call the office and she'll get the information to me. My phone number has been in the Wilson County News. Yes, and I will be <laughs> displaying all that. Okay, that perfect. Just... And the other thing that I wanted to mention before we stop, this is a program that has federal funding state funding and also local funding from United Way. There are two different United Ways that oh, okay. that support us and particularly with United Way they see a real value in this program or they wouldn't be supporting us financially. Absolutely. And all the United Way money goes to direct services to the kids. Amazing. So we're really proud about that. Yeah. That is definitely something to be proud of. So is what you're doing through this program. Amazing stuff, getting America reading. So True. thank you both so much for your time today, appearing on the show and helping us learn more about RSVP and America Reads and how seniors and kids can both benefit from this opportunity. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoy it. Appreciate it. That's all for today, folks. Thank you for tuning in to The Press Room with WCN-TV, brought to you by the Wilson County News. For more information about anything we mentioned in today's show, see the June 14th and 21st editions of the Wilson County News, or visit wilsoncountynews.com. You can also find articles corresponding to each topic discussed today in this video's description. Thank you to the Go Wilson Community app for sponsoring this week's episode of The Press Room. The Go Wilson app is your go-to digital resource for all-in-one access to community news and free resources. Download the app to experience all its features for yourself on your Apple or Android device at GoWilsonApp.com. To learn more about making the most of the Go Wilson app with your Wilson County News or Lavernia News subscription, call 830-216-4519 or visit WilsonCountyNews.com. Remember to follow us where you're watching so you never miss an episode, and consider subscribing to receive the print or digital editions of the Wilson County News each week. You can find more news or subscribe at wilsoncountynews.com, or download our app, Go Wilson, to receive updates from our newsroom at your fingertips. The app is available for Apple and Android devices at gowilsonapp.com. We hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of The Press Room. See you then!